season of resilience. Just after the recent sudden overnight freeze, which could have destroyed or delayed the flourishing of spring growth, I noticed the first roses, pops of pink on bushes in my neighborhood. And my peonies are now perkier and more abundant than ever. This is also a season of resilience in the religious calendar. Today is the culmination of Holy Week for Christians, in which we remember Jesus' last days, his death on Good Friday, and his resurrection on Easter. In the Jewish tradition this week is Passover, in which there is a Seder meal and a ritual retelling of the story of the Israelites their wilderness journey and enslavement, and finally, their freedom. Life, love, and the identity of a people survived times of cold darkness, betrayal and death and oppression. Life, love, and the identity of a people survived because of resilience. Resilience is defined generally as the ability of something to return to its original shape after it has been pulled, stretched, pressed, or bent. Now, I didn't have this prop in the first service, but I noticed it on my way out. Imagine one of these, it's just like one of these stress balls or maybe like a memory foam pillow. No matter how much you squeeze it and mold it, it returns to its original shape. Sometimes it feels like our lives have been pulled stretch, bent, or pressed. Resilience is the ability to recover or rebound from these difficult times or to adapt to the changes. This past Thursday, I helped to lead a Maundy Thursday service at First Unitarian Church in Dallas. It was my first experience of this powerful and beautiful service which in this case actually combines the stories of Maundy Thursday and Good Friday. Jesus' Last Supper, his arrest and abandonment by his disciples, and his death. Some services also include a ritual washing of each other's feet, as Jesus did for his disciples, but that's generally, generally a little too uncomfortable for Unitarian Universalists, and therefore rare in our Maundy Thursday service. Over the course of the service, the lights in the sanctuary dimmed. And as each disciple abandoned Jesus, their candle was extinguished. When the story of Jesus' crucifixion is read, the final candle, the Jesus candle in the center of the table, is extinguished as well. And the congregation is in complete darkness. This is called tenebrae, the service of shadows. This service was not only a time to hear and reflect on this very human story at the heart of our Christian roots as Unitarian Universalists, but it was also a time to reflect on the shadow times in our lives. Times of betrayal, loss, death, sacrifice, and isolation. The service was a communal recognition and ritualizing of these very human experiences. You know what? There was no message of hope at the end of that service. The congregation exited silently in the darkness. We sat with that suffering together and didn't try to resolve it. The message of Maundy Thursday, I think, has an important lesson about resilience. The lesson is challenging for some, like myself, who prefer to stay positive and hopeful in times of change or difficulty. Because resilience is not about always being hopeful or happy through it all. It's about acknowledging the hard stuff, not running away from it, but making it through and rising up again. As a hospital chaplain, and as a minister who's officiated a number of memorial services, I've seen something similar happen. When we lose a loved one, we may need to really let the reality sink in and to sit in the depths of that mourning for a period of time. Only then can we move to a place of celebrating our loved one's life through a memorial service or a similar ritual. Resilience is 
is not skipping ahead to acceptance or celebration, but allowing ourselves to move through the process of grief. There will be a time for celebrating, and that is the meaning of Easter. But we can't have Easter without Monday, Thursday, or Good Friday. The good news of Easter, that rebirth and renewal are possible, comes out of the depths of despair of the days leading up to it. When we've been through the darkness together, we can celebrate the hope and the promise of our individual and community resilience. And this is a possibility not just once a year on this day, but again and again in our lives. The name Easter actually comes from Ostara, the Anglo-Saxon fertility goddess, who brings about rebirth from the death of winter. This spring renewal is celebrated today by pagans and many others, and also on Earth Day, which happens to be this Tuesday. Early Christians adapted these pagan spring festivals to the celebration of Jesus' resurrection, which also followed a time of death and darkness, a winter of sorts. There are many Easter messages, depending on your perspective. But one of them is that who Jesus, the man and the prophet, was, and what he stood for, the hope of a different possible world, was not defeated with his death. This hope and the community that began with Jesus' disciples and exists as the Christian church today shows the incredible resilience of the great commandment to love your neighbor. Now, in this same week is the Jewish holiday of which began last Monday, evening of the 14th, and ended the evening of Tuesday the 22nd. The first night, or somewhere in those eight days, is a Seder meal, a night of remembrance and thanksgiving, and a retelling of the story of Moses leading the Israelites from enslavement in Egypt to freedom. For all eight days of Passover, Jews are to avoid leavened bread products, because as the Israelites left Egypt, they did not have time to let their bread rise. When the Israelites reached the other side of the Red Sea, finally cutting them off from the Pharaoh in Egypt, the prophet Miriam led the women in singing and dancing to celebrate their freedom. Moses told the Israelites to tell their children and grandchildren the story of how they came free. Hence, why Passover is still celebrated today. Passover is a celebration of the resilience of the Jewish people for surviving slavery and keeping their faith. According to Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, resilience comes from the fact that everyone is a learner and a teacher of the tradition through the telling and retelling of the story. It builds Jewish identity and it builds a community that endures no matter what comes their way. And I'm reminded especially of the importance of storytelling for community resilience as multiple new stories of anti-Semitism emerged this week. Three people were killed in shootings outside a Jewish community center and a Jewish retirement home in Overland Park, Kansas. Although all three victims happened to be Christians, the crime was motivated by hate and targeted specifically Jewish people. And, unfortunately, some Christians take Good Friday as an opportunity to preach an anti-Semitic message, blaming Jews for the death of Jesus. Discrimination against Jewish people continues today, albeit in many different forms, different from the, the days of enslavement in Egypt. At the same time that these historic news stories were horrific and historic news stories were coming out, there's also a storytelling occurring in the response, in people speaking out and in communities coming together in vigils, seeking clarity and meaning and support. Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter, and Passover, they all retell foundational religious stories, but they also have a deep resonance for many of us in our lives today. Like on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, we all have difficult periods in our lives when we are in the shadows of despair. Sometimes we feel entombed by 
worries and loneliness and hope is hard to come by. But then we have Easter moments, times when we're able to roll away the stone and open ourselves to, as our reading said this morning, possibilities for new life in ourselves and in our world. Passover celebrates liberation, and while most of us probably haven't experienced slavery, we may have lived through racial segregation. We may have survived abuse or addiction. We may have felt and experienced the changing role of women in society. We may have witnessed the dramatic shifts in the way that gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people are treated in this country and celebrated the growing acceptance of same-sex marriage. All of these, in some way, are stories of resilience of individuals and communities. None of these struggles are over, and we're still in the shadow time in many regards. You might think of us as uh, those who are singing and dancing with Miriam, but we're not home yet. When I was first invited to speak here at Westside, I was told that the theme for this period of leadership transition in your congregation is all shall be well. It was the 14th century Christian mystic Julian of Norwich who claims to have been told by God, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Julian of Norwich lived during the Middle Ages, a pretty bleak time with the bubonic plague taking lives all around her. Yet she had faith that all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. For Julian, it is God that will make it so. You might believe that it's the universe, or chance, or human efforts. Regardless, all shall be well is about having faith and trust in your sense of the rightness of the universe. That no matter what despair and upheaval may come our way, all shall be well. We will rise to the occasion or to the challenge. This is the meaning of resilience. The thing about resilience in a human context, though, is that unlike stress balls or memory foam, our lives rarely return to the same shape that they were in before we got in out of shape. Well, all shall be well does not mean perfect or the same as before. On somewhat of a side note, Julian's image of God is quite unusual for her time, and I thought it might resonate with some of us Unitarian Universalists. She was a Trinitarian, but for her, the second person of the Trinity was the mother, a feminine God. Mirabai Starr, who's a writer and professor of world religion, describes Julian's mother god as, quote, a spiritual hybrid that encompasses the unconditional love of Mother Mary in the Catholic tradition, the infinite compassion of Tara in the Buddhist tradition, and the indwelling holiness of the Shekinah in the Jewish tradition. It is this feminine divine hybrid that assures Julian all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of and I think that this is a very fitting theme for this time of transition for this congregation, with the departure of beloved leaders. Change can be scary, because while much is gained, much is lost as well. This loss takes away a sense of comfort and security and can cause incredible anxiety. I wonder if any of you have felt that. And there's not just anxiety and discomfort. With any loss, there's also grief. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross describes the stages of grief as denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance. And grief occurs not just as we usually think of it, with the death of a loved one or someone we know, but also comes with major life and community changes. I would guess that grief began even before your minister's departure, as you anticipated the changes that would occur, not yet knowing the extent or the particulars of what those changes might be. I imagine that, if we're honest with ourselves, that this is kind of a hard time for the congregation. But there are also opportunities, incredible
incredible opportunities. And this community is not without resilience. As I've traveled around and served many different churches as a seminarian and as an intern, I found myself actually in more than one congregation where the minister announced his upcoming departure. I don't know if it was something about my presence or what, but at first I thought, oh God, what am I going to do now that my supervisor or mentor is leaving? And the congregation responded similarly, what are we going to do without Reverend so-and-so? And I ended up, through that not very easy process, learning a lot about change and about how individuals and congregations express these five stages of grief. While one of these congregations that I was in is still very much in that transition, I've seen the other come through and rise up and demonstrate really incredible resilience. On this day, an important one in the Christian and Jewish traditions, we can learn a lot about resilience from these foundational and very human stories. The Jews were grieving the loss of their freedom and safety. And even as they journeyed back home, they probably grieved what they anticipated would be changes to the home that they remembered. It wouldn't be quite the same. And those around Jesus grieved the loss of this great leader and held vigil at his tomb until the stone was rolled back and they discovered that Jesus' body was no longer there. Their grief was mixed with awe and wonder at the mystery of it all. Jesus was living on in the hearts of his followers as love. Resilience, as we see in these stories, is not necessarily about being hopeful or happy throughout that in-between time. It's about being in those hard times, learning from them, and then rising to meet the change. It's nearly impossible to move directly to true acceptance, where you have made peace with whatever the loss was, let go of what was, and move forward with your life. And nor, is the, nor is resilience about this congregation going back to or maintaining its exact shape pre-October 2013. You will be different when your interim minister arrives this summer than you were a year before. And you will be different at the end of that interim period than you were when it started. You will be changed by this time of transition. So I invite you in these days to reflect on how Westside, how each of you as individuals and as a community are building resilience, and how you will continue to be resilient through these changes. You will change, no doubt, but I hope that you will stay true to who you are and what your mission is as a community. The Israelites' identity didn't change during their wilderness journey. In fact, the Exodus strengthened their identity and their faith. And the retelling of the Passover story continues to strengthen So how will you at Westside tell and retell your story? Through this period of change and even from generation to generation, this will contribute to your resilience. Unitarian Universalist congregations, including this one, are committed to faith development and encouraging spiritual growth across the life cycle. So, in the interest of building resilience, I hope you will also continue to grow and develop your faith. And it may be a faith that leads you to the sense that all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of shall be well. The late Gordon McKeenan, who was a Unitarian Universalist minister and prolific writer, wrote a really great short story about building a resilient faith, a faith that will help us in times of need. He tells of a time when his family's primary car was being used, and he had a very urgent mission. And so he got into his family's camper van, then ready to set out on his air. He turned the key, but found that the battery was dead from inactivity. He writes, It occurred to me that sometimes we leave our religions sitting idly in the corners of our lives awaiting some emergency, a crisis, accident, or untoward happening. Day by day, however, the depredations of our time have drained away our religion's power. 
comes a crisis, we leap to our religion and turn the key. Not a whimper, a cough, or a shudder. No light flickers. So his message? It's important to keep our religion in good shape. To recharge regularly. Because we never know when we might need it. We don't want to be left with a dead battery. So it's good to see you in church this morning. May this season be one of recharging. And as the earth grows greener and more colorful, let us roll away the stones from our hearts so that we may be open to the fullness and the possibilities that life brings for us. So I invite you to rise in body or in spirit to join me in singing our closing hymn, number 64, Oh, give us pleasure in the flowers today. 